All right, in this video, we'll take a look at Linda Elkoff's text, How is Epistemology Political? In this text, Elkoff argues that there is a necessary relationship between the political and the epistemological. And she analyzes this relationship with respect to three distinct aspects of the relationship between politics and theories of knowledge. So the first aspect of the relationship between politics and epistemology is the political conditions of knowledge production. Elkoff explains that epistemology is not some collection of texts or arguments, but it's a set of active social practices. So epistemology being the study of knowledge, theories of knowledge, is not merely some set of books on a shelf in the library. Rather, epistemology is a social practice that actively shapes how we understand what we know about knowledge. And one of the main things that Elkoff points out about the conditions of knowledge production is that, that epistemology in its practice is both gender exclusive and racially exclusive. So it's not due to merit or even interest that theories of knowledge are produced in large part by white males and have historically been so produced and largely continue to be so produced. Rather, that it's due to the conditions of power and privilege in our society that knowledge about knowledge is produced mostly by white males. And this is important because there are hierarchical discursive practices at play. So Alcoff wants to ask questions about who can be heard with respect to knowledge about knowledge, who is ignored, who is credible, who is seen as an epistemic authority with respect to theories of knowledge. So gender, race, class, sexuality. So gender, race, class, sexuality, and various aspects of social identity, which result in a hierarchy of political status, affect epistemic authority. And this becomes very important with respect to epistemic authority about knowledge itself. So in this way, the conditions of the production of theories of knowledge is political in the sense that only certain voices have epistemic authority with respect to knowledge about knowledge. The second aspect of the relationship between epistemology and politics that Elkoff discusses is the identity of the epistemologists themselves. That is the identity of those theorists who are producing knowledge about knowledge. And Elkoff argues that the evaluation of the politics of epistemology cannot be reduced to an issue of gender identity. However, epistemology is historically masculine and the masculine identities of the producers of theories of knowledge must be investigated. Maleness is a social location. It is a socially constructed location that brings a particular perspective with particular values, with particular assumptions and particular meanings that shape theories of knowledge, yet knowledge has been historically described by males, particularly white males, as objective, universal, abstract, disembodied, and eternal. So despite theories of knowledge that proclaim this kind of pure, abstract, universal status, the theories themselves are being produced in a particular context and particularly located individuals. And although the promotion of biased theories may not be intentional, as Elkoff argues, there is no pure scientific or epistemological methods. All methods that we use in science and knowledge production are employed within background assumptions involving particular values and particular metaphysical commitments. So particular values that have been discussed in epistemological critiques are values like autonomy and individualism, and certain metaphysical commitments are 
commitments about the nature of reality, whether or not objects that exist in the world are independent of knowers, whether they are constant, eternal, passive, and these are some of the metaphysical commitments and background assumptions that have been latent in the theories of knowledge that have been historically produced from particular social locations, that is, from typically middle-class heterosexual white males. So unlike the politics of the conditions of knowledge production, the background assumptions and metaphysical commitments of particular theorists who are responsible for producing theories of knowledge cannot be said to influence only the context of knowledge discovery. Rather, these assumptions and commitments impact the formulation of particular hypotheses, the premises from which one starts a hypothesis or theory, the kind of evidence taken to justify some claim or hypothesis, and the models of justification used to legitimize a given hypothesis or knowledge claim. So in this way, the objectivity of knowledge is itself influenced by the identity of those producing theories of knowledge. For example, the focus of epistemologists has been, since at least the ancient Greeks, the focus on theories of knowledge has been a focus on justification, which assumes that knowledge is, is an individual endeavor. So justification is said to be one of the conditions of knowledge. Some belief isn't knowledge unless it's justified. That is, unless a person can give a reason as to why they ought to hold that belief, the belief isn't understood as knowledge. So justification, what it means to justify a knowledge claim, has been a primary focus for epistemologists for literally thousands of years. Yet the focus on justification is, is held up by a commitment to or a belief in individualism. Yet despite this commitment to individualism, it has recently become clear that most knowledge is not something that we come by as individuals. That is, most knowledge is collective. I mean, think of the knowledge claims that you could make. What do you know, and how did you come to know it? For example, when were you born? Do you know when you were born? How do you know it? Do you know that individually? Is it something that you perceived? What was the source of, of that knowledge? Do you know what your name is? How do you know that? Do you know that the earth is round and not flat? How do you know these things? Are these things that you discovered about the world by perceiving them? Or is your knowledge of these things collective? That is, do they depend not only on your observation of some object in the world, do they require things like testimony from someone else? For example, I assume that you know what your name is because somebody told you that was your name. I assume that you know that the earth is round because somebody told you that the earth is round, not that you observed it as such. Right? So much of the, the knowledge that we have is not acquired individually, yet our theories of knowledge reflect this commitment to justification that relies on the notion that we acquire knowledge as individuals. So if we were to reject individualism as a background assumption, something that many epistemologists, including social epistemologists, feminist epistemologists, and recently some mainstream epistemologists have done, or are at least beginning to do, the focus turns, the focus turns from the justification of my beliefs. I know that the earth is round because I observed it. I know that the earth is round because... So the, the focus on justifying my individual beliefs becomes less relevant, and the relations of social organizations to belief formation becomes more relevant. So we can see how rejecting the value of individualism and embracing an understanding of knowledge as a more collective endeavor requires an exploration of the politics of epistemology. That is, if we know 
in relation to others, if we are in interdependent on other knowers, then we have to understand the conditions, the politics, and the relationship of interdependent communities of knowledge. This does not mean that knowledge is relative. Knowledge is not relative. It's not the case that if somebody claims to know that the earth is flat, then it is, and that that knowledge claim is equally as good as the knowledge claim that the earth is round. No. Inquiring into the values and the, the politics of epistemology doesn't mean that knowledge is relative. What it means is that knowledge is political, and the values and assumptions and biases, the politics that are involved in the production of knowledge, must be made transparent in theories of knowledge. So the political and the epistemological can both be rationally and possibly objectively discussed. The point is, is that the epistemological cannot be separated from the political. Epistemology is inherently political. And the third aspect of the relation between politics and epistemology is that politics, which Elkoff defines as relationships of power and privilege between persons and knowers, and the ways in which these relationships are maintained, reproduced, and contested. So politics is ubiquitous in the social, and thus in the discursive landscape. By discursive, we mean the use of language. So philosophical epistemologies, philosophical theories of knowledge, are not unique in being political. Elkoff's not trying to single out epistemology, but she is arguing that, among other domains of inquiry, it's important to understand that epistemology is political because it has been represented as apolitical, as absolute and universal and immune to political critique. And this is especially important with respect to theories of knowledge because epistemologies are theories by which all epistemic discourse is legitimized or delegitimized. So epistemology has political effects in authorizing or excluding, legitimizing or delegitimizing particular voices, particular discourses, and hierarchical structures. And as Elkoff notes, one of Marx's greatest contributions to epistemology or to the study of knowledge about knowledge is his making transparent the material conditions of knowledge production under capitalism. So Marx showed that just as capitalism is not an absolute economic condition, it's one form, it's a historical contingent form of organizing an economic system. It's historically contingent, and in the same way, knowledge is historically contingent. Knowledge is not absolute. Theories of knowledge are not absolute, but historically contingent. Further, Marx influenced Horkheimer and Adorno, among others, who, who revealed that the background ontological assumption that nature is this constant, inert object that allows for prediction and control is an assumption shaped by capitalist values and goals. And this is a, a truly important point, not just for this discussion, but especially in philosophies of technology and environmental philosophy, as well as development ethics, bioethics, and other areas of applied philosophy. Because this ontological assumption that that which is known, nature, objects of knowledge rather than subjects of knowledge, bodies rather than minds, objects of knowledge, can be exploited and controlled and predicted. And so we have this current understanding of nature in which it's something to be exploited. It's a raw material. And this issue is being explored, as I said, in a variety of areas of philosophy and other inter interdisciplinary fields. This one assumption about reality, about the fact that 
reality is such that objects found in nature that are knowable can be predicted, can be controlled by humans, and thus are there, there for human exploitation, which cause a number of problems, not least of which is environmental de degradation. But that's for another, another class. So the point here that Elkoff is trying to make is that epistemologies affect discourses. Theories of knowledge and the background assumptions and metaphysical commitments that go along with these theories of knowledge affect the way we talk about various things, including medicine. Again, think back to Fausto Sterling's account of surgeries on intersex infants, the environment, other people. And so the ways in which epistemologies affect discourses is important because these effects on other discourses are influenced not only by the theories of knowledge, but by the political contingencies of particular social contexts. That is, the theories of knowledge are politically shaped and influenced, and thus particular social contexts, in the Marx example, capitalism and the commitments and assumptions that go along with the social capitalist situation, affects theories of knowledge, which in turn affect our discourses about various things in the world. So epistemology is necessarily political. With respect to truth, though, Elkoff wants to argue that claiming that epistemology is necessarily political does not entail that truth is necessarily political. Because epistemology is concerned with belief and standards of justification as well as truth, we could un unproblematically claim that epistemologies, theories of knowledge, are political because what we believe is political and our standards of justification are political. But truth need not necessarily be political, even though epistemology is. However, Elkoff does say that truth is a human idea, and is thus historically and contingently located and shaped by particular background assumptions and values as well, and thus truth is not outside of history. So truth has been variously defined in terms of coherence theories of truth, instrumental theories of truth, pragmatic theories of truth, and certainty, which we begin to see with Cartesian skepticism. But neither truth nor knowledge has to be collapsed into the political or reduced to politics. But the point here, the point of, uh, of Alcoff's text, is that both epistemic and political considerations need to be part of epistemological theories. So including politics and epistemology is necessary on epistemic grounds, and it's necessary on political grounds. So on Alkoff's view, acknowledging the transparency of politics in epistemologies can improve theories of knowledge by increasing its accuracy and by improving capabilities for self-critique. So with each of the three aspects of the relation between politics and epistemologies that she discussed in the first part of the text, she shows how those relationships can be improved by attending to the political nature of theories of knowledge. So with respect to the political conditions of knowledge production, Elkoff claims that our goal ought to be a kind of social transformation that allows for theorists of knowledge to be chosen not by unfair privilege and prejudice, but rather by merit or interest. But this requires a transformation of our social and political landscape. With respect to the second aspect of the relationship between politics and knowledge, the claim that the identity of the theorist determines the kinds of epistemologies that are produced, Elkoff argues that we need to do genealogies of these relationships between theorists and, and the theories that they produce in order to illuminate the social embeddedness and political nature of knowledge production and knowledge about knowledge production. And with respect to the third aspect of the relationship between politics and, and theories of knowledge, that the political results in discursive interventions, Elkoff argues that 
analyses of the political effects of discourse are needed. So analyses of epistemic discourse are important on both political and epistemic grounds because authorizing only a privileged group of voices is both politically pernicious and epistemically pernicious. It's neither good politics nor good epistemology to authorize only certain voices because of their social privilege. So for Elkoff, not only can epistemology survive self-consciousness and awareness about its political nature, it can actually be stronger and counter postmodern critiques that aim to dismiss epistemology.